Hi, I'm Luke, and welcome to Psyched for Nature. Today we will be continuing our crash course on vervets, and our second installment will be focused on their social lives and their hierarchy. For this video, I had the pleasure of consulting an expert in vervet monkey behavior, director of the Inkao Vervet Project in South Africa, Dr. Erica van de Waal. She's also a professor at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland. She'll be helping us later on in the video to unpack some complicated concepts. But now that we have introductions out of the way, let's get back to our crash course on vervets. Vervet monkey society is despotic, but strikingly complex and dynamic. You have warring families with figureheads holding particular seats of power. Alliances can be formed and destroyed, and there are always characters climbing to reach the top through skillful political moves or physical force. Vervet monkeys are a social species that live in groups of usually about 20 individuals, and groups are typically composed of a few adult males and then multiple adult females and their children. Everyone fights with everyone within the group, but their cohesion is remarkable against outside threats. The colorful circles on this map represent the home ranges of different vervet groups. Notice the sizable overlap between group territories. This overlap ensures that certain groups will encounter each other on a somewhat regular basis. So what exactly happens when groups come into contact? Encounters can last minutes or hours, and can be aggressive where groups posture and fight in an attempt to drive the other away. Or an encounter can be passive, where they hardly acknowledge the existence of the other group. And there can even be positive exchanges between the groups. In group encounters, when vervet monkey groups come into contact, they are defending their territory. Females engage most in between group encounters because they are the philopatric sex, the sex that stays in the group that they're born into. So they need to protect their resources for themselves and their offspring. Sometimes fights can get physical and monkeys can be injured or killed, but this is infrequent, thank goodness. Like I mentioned before, there can be some positive exchanges aside from aggression and threats during encounters. To help explain what I mean, we luckily have someone a little more knowledgeable to help break it down. So when a two neighboring group of vervets get into contact, um, usually it's more uh, aggressive. So there is not a lot of behavioral uh, interaction. But sometimes we have males that might disperse uh, soon, that try to approach the group a bit more. So at sexual maturity, a male usually disperse to neighboring groups. If they don't do so, then they are usually slowly kicked out by, by the resident individuals. And this is uh, done to avoid inbreeding. And after, with the dispersal, um, that's how we get uh, uh, genetic uh, diversity within uh, the vervet groups. I think most of the exchange between groups um, are taking place actually when male uh, disperse in a, in, in a new group. At the moment, I'm starting a new grant on, um, on understanding knowledge movement across the groups. And with this, um, I hope to see how much new males learn uh, from, from the groups they enter in, but also the other way around how much uh, uh, immigrants can actually bring knowledge uh, to, to a group. Males leave their home group at sexual maturity and bounce around between groups about every year or so, depending on how good they have it. As I mentioned before, females remain in the groups that they're born into throughout their whole lives. So family ties and bonds between related and unrelated females are really important. Females have strict and relatively stable hierarchies in vervet society, and your family's rank is pretty stable, barring a massive coup. The G family will always rank above the U family, who will always rank above the X family, so on down the line. Power and status within vervet groups depends on support, from both related and unrelated individuals. Vervets can't survive and hold top positions by themselves. 
But helping is very nepotistic in vervet society. And one of my favorite parts about the hierarchy is how inheritance of rank works. It differs slightly for males and females. Let's take a look at the dominant female of this group and her daughters. The mother is the queen bee of this group and holds a lot of power, and she's not afraid to use it. She has two daughters of different ages who stand a chance of taking her place at the top. From our perspective as humans, it seems logical that the oldest daughter would inherit all the power, but we'd better consult someone a little more knowledgeable to figure out who gets the throne. Yeah, so this is quite surprising because for us, historically, it was always the, the, the firstborn who was getting uh, more out of the, the family. And, uh, and with the Vervets, um, it's actually the, the, the youngest daughter who will become the highest rank. And this is uh, because of support. So the mother will uh, defend uh, her youngest uh, daughter uh, against uh, the other uh, offspring she has. So it looks like young Green Bay will inherit the throne over her older sister, Grisel. Oh well, that sounds like a lot of responsibility anyway. What is really um, surprising for me is that with now my 15 years of experience at watching the Vervets, I got um, a feeling about what is happening with, uh, with the, the male offspring. And, um, and so male dispersed to another group and I was here thinking that maybe it's not the same as this inheritance of rank that we have with female, but actually the opposite. And that actually the son of the lowest ranking females um, are the ones that enter more easily uh, in a group and manage to climb the ladder of the hierarchy faster than the, than the alpha female son. And so we decided to test this uh, hypothesis empirically with a master's student. We found that the mother's rank significantly affects the ranks that their sons achieve later on in life. In the first year after dispersal, sons of lower ranked individuals attain higher ranks, whereas sons of higher ranked individuals attain lower ranks. This could possibly be because of the fact that the lower ranked individuals are a lot more strategic at how they go about behaving with others. They groom other group members and often don't aggress them as much, whereas sons of dominant females behave how they used to in their home group. Not grooming others much, but expecting to be groomed, being a lot more aggressive towards juveniles, because that worked out for them really well in their home groups. But if you're being aggressive to the juveniles a lot, you may not be likely to make friends with the mothers much. You know, it makes sense that more diplomatic individuals would make it farther and faster in new groups once they disperse, but it just still feels counterintuitive somehow. Anyway, if you'd like to learn more about Varun's thesis, I will leave a link to it in the description. It is a great read. We've really only just scratched the surface on what we can learn about vervet monkey social behavior. But now hopefully you have a good grasp on the basics. Thank you to Dr. Erica van de Waal and Varun Manowari for lending their time and experience. You can learn more about Dr. van de Waal's research and her field station, the Inkawu Vervet Project, in the link in the description. You can also follow the Inkawu Vervet Project on Twitter, at InkawuP, to get research updates and to learn when volunteer opportunities are available. And you can keep up with them on Instagram, to learn about the lives of the monkeys. Thanks for joining me here. I hope that you learned something about the intricate lives of vervet monkeys, and um, I hope you'll join me for future installments of this series. For now, have a good one. <laughs>